Futures Radio Show, sponsored by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world effectively manage risk. For access to free educational tools and resources for the active individual trader, please visit activetrader.cmegroup.com. Com. Every day, traders and investors dive in to tackle the ever-changing markets to find opportunity. Futures Radio Show is your number one source for answers to the questions that all market participants want to ask. Veteran futures trader Anthony Crudelli sits down with the most influential leaders and top traders in the industry. Now, here's your host, Anthony Crudelli. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in for this episode with Mark Newton. Remember, new shows are posted every Monday and Thursday. You can subscribe to the show on iTunes and YouTube. If you're enjoying the show, please leave a review on iTunes. Before I play today's interview for you, I want to give a shout out to the great sponsors of Futures Radio Show. See Me Group, Trading Technologies, RJO Futures, and Top Step Trader. To learn more about these sponsors and the important things they are doing for futures traders, be sure to click on their logos on our website. Today, I chatted with Mark Newton, president and founder of Newton Advisors. Quick background on Mark. He's a CMT with more than 20 years of buy and sell side experience in the financial services industry. Mark's expertise is primarily in using advanced methods of technical analysis to identify trend duration, relative strength, and momentum. In today's show, we chatted about the process that a person has to go through to become a CMT. Mark shares with us his favorite technical analysis tools, how he has personalized those tools, and he shares with us a recent example of how he executes a trade. We discussed his favorite tools for determining a bull or bear market, and last but not least, Mark tells us what he thinks of current market sentiment and seasonality in U.S. equities. Without further ado, let me take you right to the interview with Mark. Mark, thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me here, Anthony. Great having you here today, Mark. Now, you're a CMT, and for those of you that don't know what a CMT is, it's a chartered market technician. It's the highest level a technician can achieve. I think a lot of traders don't even know what someone has to go through to get a CMT. So let's start there, Mark. What did you have to achieve to get this qualification? Yeah, that's no, a great question. I think a lot of people wonder because they've heard of the CFA, of course, you know, and, and many people wonder what's a CMT. And it's really started to gain prominence in recent years. You know, we really need to have some sort of a structure behind how people look at technical analysis and a certain set of rules so that people don't just analyze however they want to look at things. And so so I, I started with a lot of the really common, you know, books, a lot of what they call, you know, the Bible of technical analysis, uh, Edwards and McGee. I, I think the name of it is Technical Analysis of Stock Trends, and it was probably printed about 100 years ago. Uh, but it, it covers a lot of the commonly looked at uh, technical patterns that are present in all markets, head and shoulders patterns and wedges and pennants and reversal formations and all sorts of things like that. So that's really one of the books that I started with. And I also uh, looked at Martin Pring and John Murphy's books, and they're pretty all encompassing. They have really a wealth of data that cover, um, you know, a, a ton of different topics. So, you know, normally when one starts to learn technical analysis, you have no idea of which area you really want to focus in. So by looking at a book like that, which really has about 100 different topics, when you look at momentum, or you look at sentiment or seasonality, uh, you know, just trend following, whether you want to be really momentum based or counter trend or look at things like Elliott Wave or GAN analysis. I mean, some of these books really have a lot uh, to do with those. And so when I took the exam 20 years ago, it was a lot of real basics, uh, but it was still pretty thorough and covered the gamut with regards to a lot of different technical uh, topics. Now, I think recently they've begun to focus a little more on just back testing and, and a little more of the scientific methods on trying to, to really make sure that, uh, you know, and there's several different books that, that cover uh, those, those kind of things too, but just trying to make sure that it stands up to a certain level. Whereas a lot of people, you know, on the fundamental side, they tend to be really skeptical of technical analysis. Everybody's got their own style and, and they're, they're wondering because they get things 
10 times a day from different people and they all have different styles of analysis. And so it's really important to make sure that we're all on the same page and how we look at things. So, you know, I, I got my start in the early 1990s um, and I work with a small mutual fund company called the Calvert Group out of Washington, D.C., you know, just north of there. And, and it really began right out of, after I got out of school and I became a stockbroker and got my Series 7. And I always had a passion for the markets. You know, my, my father and I made some money for college back in the, the mid 1980s. And I used to watch the Far East markets in Japan and watch those markets literally go up every day. And it was just exciting. And I, I always wondered you know, how it was like to really make money in, in stocks and how the whole process worked. And so that really was what piqued my interest initially. You know, I studied finance in school. And when I got out, I knew that I didn't really even want to go to grad school. I knew I wanted to get into to finance and, and really do a lot with regards to technical analysis and, and learning how prices move. You know, and I learned at an early age that you know, fundamentals, while they're important in the long run, they really didn't have all that much effect as to how prices move. And so, you know, you can have a certain level of intrinsic value and prices can go above or below, but it really didn't do it for me in terms of, you know, figuring out the holy grail as to how stocks truly work. And so I've come to realize that a lot of that just has to do with sentiment and cycles and, you know, obeying stock trends. And so, you know, I got my start, you know, 25 years ago and, and learning about these through a lot of different books that, that many of us, uh, you know, still can go and, and read and they're still there. And I started out really being more of a momentum guy and, and reading Investors Business Daily, looking at stocks breaking out to new high territory on a weekly and monthly basis, searching for those best patterns that you can find. And going on from there to learn more about Elliott Wave, learning about um, the works of Tom DeMarc, which I still utilize for counter trend analysis, and learning more about the use of time in technical analysis uh, by W.D. Gann and some other people that focus on that. And so, you know, the, the, the CMT Association at this point, which used to be the Market Technicians Association, the MTA, uh, you know, they don't do a whole lot with, with GAN and Time or really even DeMarc at this point, but they've done a little bit with Elliott Wave and they've tried to incorporate that into their level three exam. Uh, but it, it, right now it still isn't really a three year process of taking tests once a year uh, that really gotten quite rigorous. When I took them 20 years ago, they weren't nearly as difficult, I think, as they are now. And they really are trying to weed people out and really make sure people want to have an interest in learning technicals and not just being a fundamental guy that, that wants to add another designation to his name. And so, you know, that was important to me. I, I think that, you know, knowing that I'm surrounded by a group of like-minded people that, that have a passion for the markets and, and really use technicals in their day-to-day -day life is, is something that, uh, you know, I'm happy to be a part of. So, you know, I've been a member of the CMT Association now for you know, really since the late 90s. And, and I think it's a great organization. And, uh, you know, I, I would encourage people to, to look into uh, getting their CMT charter. I think it's a, it's a great designation to have. After learning about all of these different indicators, which indicator or indicators ended up being your favorite and the ones that you chose as your primary focus for doing technical analysis? Well, I have several. I, I, I tend to be primarily a momentum driven type, what I would call a swing or a position trader. And, and I don't, you know, I don't like to be in and out of stocks on a day to day basis, but I like to hold things for four to six weeks, hopefully, and, uh, you know, more get into positions that I hope will work based on, you know, good risk reward and, and what I'm looking at. And really, I tend to be more of a, a classic chartist. So I don't necessarily you know, as opposed to those that really create algorithms and try to backtest things, I, I, I really try to keep it simple with regards to finding the best patterns out there. I use a lot of trend lines. I look for classical chart formations. I want to find stocks that are breaking out to new high territory on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. You know, really find the best charts out there, not only for stocks that are going up, but also stocks that are starting to break down. So I make use of a lot of relative strength, um, not only stocks versus the market, but stocks versus other stocks and stocks versus themselves in terms of how they trade and just look at, you know, relative strength index, RSI, but also use relative strength versus other, um, you know, versus other sectors. And so, 
you know, I, I think that's really key in, in doing technical. So you, that's really a starting point. From there, I would say uh, I've added DeMarc analysis for more counter trend type techniques. I find that that's really invaluable in terms of being able to buy stocks that are broken out. Uh, they're not susceptible for giving it all back. And, and DeMarc is a tool. It's a great complement, in my view, to a traditional trend following model because it allows one to really you know, sell stocks that are moving up and buy stocks that are moving down. And sometimes that helps to coincide with what the fundamental crowd is thinking as well. So I tend to utilize that. And I also do a lot with time, which is, uh, I think, a rarity. I think very few people do a whole lot with that. So I tend to study a lot of different time cycles and uh, do a lot of different time-based studies that I think give me a real edge. So when you combine it, you really have momentum, you have DeMarc, you have time, and then you have, uh, um, you know, I use a lot of sentiment also and in, in, in some seasonality in my work. So, you know, it's, it's tough to pinpoint, say, this is the one thing I use. It's really a combination of things that I really feel gives me a huge edge over a lot of people because I'm very open-minded and I tend to use, you know, probably five, six different things and I blend them all together um, I guess I would add to that that I do a lot of intermarket type work. I'll look at different assets that are correlating with one another, and I'll also look at time frames. So I'll look at a daily chart, a weekly chart, a monthly chart, and I'll try to blend it all in where I can really find that something is starting to move and trend in a certain direction. So when it comes down to it, I mean, that's really what separates me from the pack is that when I, I use, you know, relative work, um, I look at you know time frame analysis and just looking at stocks versus sectors, but really all of that blends into really a, a trend following type model, where I'm always seeking you know the best performing stocks or really ones that are also starting to break down and and, and go from there. What I like about what you're saying is that you've personalized this. You're not going by the book, just following what an indicator is saying uh, should happen. You go beyond that and you're, uh, to me, building a theme uh, in the market. You're looking at multiple indicators for confirmations, and then you decide whether or not you want to step into that market if it's a good look to you. And I think this is so important for everybody out there listening. I mean, here's somebody like you who's been studying technical analysis for many years, and you don't go buy the book. You've personalized your strategy. You're not just living and dying by one indicator. So let's take it a step further. I talk about execution all the time. To me, it doesn't matter if you have the greatest strategy under the sun, you now have to execute it. So take us through a current example of you identifying something through your indicators and then getting to the point of executing it. Okay. So for example, you know, I, I turned bearish on the market right around the middle part of September. And uh, initially, you know, it's important to see a few different things. One is that if you're gonna if you're gonna try to make a counter trend play, um, which is in this case what I wanted to do as the markets were entering uh, September, you saw a tremendous amount of bullish sentiment, and that was really key initially. Uh, you started to see negative divergences also; those were important. You saw stocks moving to new high territory, um, but yet momentum really didn't follow suit, and so that was the second part of the equation. Uh, the third is that the breadth really started to drop off pretty substantially. And so that was also important in terms of looking at that. And the final ingredient, or the final couple of ingredients, one was that I wanted to see personally see S&P show evidence of counter trend type sell signals or exhaustion developing on, on the uptrend. So you saw that right into the middle part of September. And that really gave you uh, a pretty decent um at least a confluence of a lot of different things coming together. Not only seasonality was poor, but sentiment was very bullish. Uh, negative divergence was present. The breadth had started to uh, go down substantially, starting really back in the latter part of August. Advanced decline had peaked and started down. The last uh, element in, in really that, uh, that equation is price. And price, of course, is the most important indicator of all. I mean, you really need price to break before you can really initiate any type of, uh, of trade. And so for me, you know, I just, I tend to be a little shorter term in how I look at things. Um, my, my time frame is, is not, you know, 
multi months or years. But when I'm going to initiate a trade, I'll look at things. I'll generally use daily charts and use hourly charts. And so, you know, daily charts of the S&P, for example, the last you know major swing low we saw really was at the latter part of June, and it started higher by then, making it higher and higher. Uh, moves in price, but yet momentum gradually started to drop off. But it was really during the day of almost, I believe, early October, October the 4th, when S&P broke. And it's really the act of breaking uh, the two to three month uptrend when all the other factors are in place that really put everything together to say, okay, the market is finally, price is finally starting to confirm what all these other indicators have been suggesting could happen for the last month. And so that's just one example. But but historically, you know, and the S&P at that time was right around, you know, 2920, I believe, is when it broke. And so when it broke that trend, that was the first key that I really wanted to be focused more on being short. And then really when it broke September lows, that was really a much bigger thing. And that really helped the market to start to accelerate at a time when, you know, really people were least expecting it, I believe. So, but oftentimes my trades will involve um, the start of divergence, um, positive or negative, you know, depending on whether I'm buying or selling, and really the presence of DeMarc tools where something will get, you know, for example, if I'm buying into a, a dramatic pullback within an uptrend, I, I like buying things really two ways. Either the chart looks fantastic, it's moved up for years, and then it starts to base for maybe two, three, four months and does nothing. And then the stock all of a sudden starts to break those former highs, be it daily, weekly, monthly, and does so in very good volume. And so that's a really a type A type chart that I really want to be focused on. The other is when I use the mark in a way where I'll wait for counter trend buy signals to emerge in really oversold conditions, but yet with divergence within an ongoing intermediate term uptrend, but when the daily trend is broken. So you have a severe sell off that falls over a period of time, but then it hits a key level of intermediate term support. And so to, to initiate those trades, you really have to rely on weekly and or monthly charts and wait. So where the daily is very oversold, sentiment is very bearish, but based on maybe put to call data on a certain stock and you see a rapid, a lot of puts being traded all of a sudden, uh, but it's coming into a decent level of support and you're starting to get the mark indications of, uh, of exhaustion. So. When I see those line up, that really is a, is a great chance to really buy dips. So, I mean, those are really two different examples of, of how I would use, you know, my tool set to really trade something not only that's breaking out to new high territory, but also to really buy dips of something that is uh, plummeting and, and nobody wants to be involved with it. But, you know, I look at the weekly charts and they're in good shape. It's really just daily damage. And so... For me, that's the importance of using multiple time frames and saying, OK, it might look bad on a, on a daily basis. But when you look at the weekly and the monthly, it's actually in very good shape. And so it might just be, you know, things like MACD or RSI or trending down. MACD is trending down, has rolled over, broken the signal line. RSI has been trending lower, is closing in on oversold. But the weekly and the monthly, the momentum is still in decent shape. And so that is really the bread and butter as to how I make a trade of that sort. And to get back to your other point, I mean, you mentioned, you know, some of these indicators and, and you know, there, there are thousands of indicators these days. And so I would encourage people to, you know, to really try to figure out a way that you can combine several different indicators to be successful. Like I'm not an indicator guy. I, I don't I don't look at buying uh, initiating a trade just because I see a crossover and a moving average. You know, I, I think very little of buying something just because it hits a 200-day moving average, for example. I mean, some people look at those things and they, they spread them around the trading desk as if they're the holy grail. But, it, you know, it really is it's going to be more dependent on price and time coming together more than just a moving average itself, which really has very little value. Uh, I would argue if something gets way above or below a moving average, um, that has more value when the moving average starts to turn than really across itself of a certain moving average. So anyway, the, you know, the indicators when back tested, most of them have about a coin flip rate of success. And so, as you mentioned, you know, why read the books? They gave you the standard formula of how to use an RSI and MACD. And are these really all that worthwhile? Well, I would argue, you know, it's really the way you apply them. And, and the divergences are more important than just something being overbought or oversold by itself. Though that itself has really 
very little value. But when people realize that, that really time has a much bigger effect than price, so, you know, a Fibonacci level might have very little value. You know, 38.2, 61.8, what do those actually mean? But if price has gone from zero to 100 in 100 days and then corrects 38 days and corrects 38 points, I'll tell you what, that has a heck of a lot more importance. And so it's really trying to put things together in a way that very few people have done uh, that can really add a lot of value when you have a confluence of a lot of different things coming together to, to really make for the perfect setup. Yeah, a couple of things I want to talk about is uh, you mentioned and something that I agree with is the time of the chart that gets you in should also get you out because you talked about looking at the dailies and you're seeing some breakdowns there, but then the weekly stays intact. I think a lot of traders, what they do is they'll, they'll look at one chart to get them in and then they'll get scared out of that trade, even though that setup is still working on that chart because a different time frame could potentially <laughs> look different and, and, and get them out. So right. I think that was an important point. And something that uh, I want to go back to is the initial example you gave was a counter trend trade. And what you said, I really liked, you said ingredients and I say confirmation. That is very important to me when going against the counter trend. It cannot be just one of my indicators because I use multiple ones as well. And just going back to like developing your style, yeah. it can't just be one indication, especially, especially going against a primary yeah. trend because you know one indication is all it is. It's one indication on its own. But like you mentioned, when you are seeing multiple things lining up, uh, and I think specifically when you're going against a trend, that is so important. Right. I think yeah. everybody listening, you really have to you have to really think about that in your trading because when you're going with the trend, and I'm going to ask you this, for me, I, I a lot of times will just take one indication because I'm going with the trend. But when I'm going against the trend, I absolutely have to have confirmation. Is that similar with you? Um, it's always a process. I, I don't think it's it's any fewer. But I mean, I don't necessarily consider you know sentiment, uh, you know seasonality or sentiment necessarily. If I'm going to buy a breakout, but I'll just use, you know, is there volume? Is there demark? I might use different things. But, yeah. but generally, when the trend uh, is in your favor, then yeah, you, there's a lot less that it can go wrong when you're when you're buying something that's been basing for five years and all of a sudden, let's say it's hit 35 times over a five year period and then it breaks out above 30. I mean, you know, the odds are gonna be in your favor generally to be able to buy, not only buy the breakout, depending on your time frame and risk management or whatever, but, but you obviously buy the pullback and, and hope the volume recedes and think that you've got a great, you know, you've got a great position and, and something is just starting to show signs of uh, you know, of really starting to advance. So that, that's yeah. how I look at things. But yeah, I agree 100%. You need more to fight the trend. You don't usually want to be fighting trends, but um, it's just an example I came up with in that uh, particular yeah. instance. Yeah. Well, that's what kills me so much when I see people talk on TV and on Twitter about giving, you know, fundamental reasons why the market should stop going up or people say uh, one indication that they <laughs> see on a daily chart or a weekly chart to saying that the, that the market should go down from here. I always look at it and say, when you're going against a primary trend, you need multiple things. I mean, that, that's just something that I've learned in my experience. It's not going to be one thing uh, to, that goes against the trend that all of a sudden is going to turn a trend. It's, it needs to be multiple things lining up. And, and, and you really explain that well and what you're looking at in your analysis. And Yeah, but so one thing, the one thing I can pinpoint, you know, price is the most important thing. And until price confirms, you know, by breaking out above a trend line of some sort, it doesn't matter what anything else says because you very well could be wrong you know a lot of people look at things and say it's a head and shoulders pattern and it doesn't break below the neckline and it's just consolidation and it's off to new highs and so it's really really important to get that that price break right i mean that has to be weighted more heavily than than really anything yeah very well said I, I, you're right i mean price needs to prove your analysis <laughs> bottom line right it doesn't matter what you think you need proof through price Let's talk about determining a bull market versus a bear market. Obviously, a lot of discussion right now with the S&P 500 coming off its highs. A lot of people are saying we're entering a bear market. Some people are saying we're already in a bear market. For day traders, I don't think this is super important, but I do think it is nice to know what the longer term trend is. So what's your favorite tool for determining a bull or bear market? Well, that answer is going to differ just because, uh, you know, from maybe what the public thinks only because 
a lot of it depends on your time frame, I think, you know, and, and how you look at things. You know, we look at a stock like Amazon or Netflix, it's gone up 300%, and then it goes down 20%, and the media will say, well, it's in a bear market, we've been down 20%, and it's, you know, I, I have to laugh at that. Um, I understand that the media wants to make things really easy to understand by, uh, you know, the, the common investor, and that it's, it's necessary to put labels on things, but oftentimes those just don't make a lot of sense to me. So I, I you know, I want to see something where, uh, over time, we have a very easily definable trend of, of higher highs and higher lows to say that, okay, uh, you're officially in a bull trend. And typically, I'll use a, a monthly chart. I, you know, if it's, for example, if the, the current market, you know, the S&P, the fact that we've been going down, you know, 7 8% really in, in recent weeks, that doesn't mean a whole lot if the longer term uptrend from 2009 and 2016 are still in place. So I would still define, you know, the current equity market really as being in a bull market. And I think that, uh, you know, the indices aren't always the best guide to the underlying stocks. I certainly understand that. Uh, and, and you could say the same for ETFs, that sometimes the market, the, the indices can go up, but yet not as many stocks are participating and there can be a lot of stocks that are moving down off their highs and, and uh, but you, you have to have a, a frame of reference. And so, you know, I, I don't have any specific tool that I'll say, OK, you know, I broke this, therefore it's in a bear. But I, I look at longer term trend lines based on weekly or a monthly basis. And so uh, if I see a serious break of a trend that's lasted for, you know, five years or longer, then I'll say, you know, I think we're starting to, to break and we're, we're, you know, now turning down. But I don't necessarily I, I don't see the reason for ever having to say that something is in a bear market or bull market. I mean, a lot of it, it's the eye of the beholder in terms of, you know, what what frame of reference. I think with the age of social media these days, most people have such a short term focus that, you know, you, you're looking at a 280 word tweets every day, you know, and looking what the market's doing on a day by day basis and people really lose fact of, you know, the, the longer term trends that are intact. So, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know if there's any perfect uh, answer for that. Yeah, I agree with that. I don't think there is a perfect answer for it. And once again, it always comes down to what time frame are you executing in? And for me as a day trader, it is important for me to know the primary trend on my daily chart, even though I'm not executing uh, on a longer term time frame like the daily, but I like to know what the daily chart shows me for my intraday execution. Really right. because if we're above moving averages that I look at and above uptrends right. that I'll look at, then I'll trade more aggressively to the buy side. If we're below them, I'll trade more aggressively to the sell side. And that's it. To me, it's an additional confirmation to help me execute intraday. I wanna move on and talk about market sentiment. You've mentioned it today. What are your thoughts on market sentiment right now in equities? You know, I think that, so we're in the third week of October, and I think that sentiment started out in September being a lot more optimistic than I would have expected. Um, but it really took some time. I think that markets were pretty resilient throughout all the tariff and trade war talk, and we continued to grind higher, and that got people extraordinarily complacent at a time when markets seasonally tend to sell off. And uh, that changed very quickly just in recent weeks. And so it wasn't necessarily that, you know, Italy is going to go at their own on their own budget or that Trump is pulling out of the Saudi Arabia summit. I mean, those aren't factors that, you know, really should cause the market to sell off or cause sentiment to change. But I just think that um, you know, sometimes these ways have a, a funny way of working out. I think everybody looked at the seasonality as being bullish as we head into Q4, thinking that, wow, woo, we're out of the woods. We got through August and September with no major, you know, trend damage. And so now we're into the fourth quarter and really the, mo the most bullish part of the, you know, midterm election cycle. So it's right to be positive. And, and historically it has been, you know, it's just that we didn't really see any sort of correction historically in August, September. And so that was overdue. So sentiment, in my opinion, has started to shift pretty rapidly from complacent to now more of a concern. I would argue that it's starting to get bearish at this point, 
but we don't really see evidence of fear yet. And so I use a few different things for sentiment. I use, you know, not only I look at the VIX a lot, so I'll look at the shape of the VIX curve and structure. Uh, I look at put to call ratios on equities. I used to be an options trader at the SIBO in Chicago. So, uh, you know, I didn't really have a lot of respect for the total put to call, but I often use the equity put to call as having a lot more uh, significance. I mean, you, you see people come into the pit and buy you know, scrambling to buy puts at a time, and that means a little more than the indices these days and buying, you know, puts and futures and, and when you tie things to stock and it could be a completely different metric. So the equity put to call ratio is something I look at. Uh, I look at DSI. I look at, you know, the CFTC data, I think when it hits extremes can be useful, but, you know, it, it doesn't always work. It depends on what you're looking at, but it's really a combination of a few things. And so, Daily sentiment index, I, the traditional sentiment polls, uh, you know, AII along with investors intelligence, I tend to like them better when they both line up. And that hasn't always been the case in recent years. I think that there have been times when, you know, the, the American Association of Individual Investors poll, AII, has been, uh, you know, pretty subdued, whereas the, the investors intelligence was more uh, a bigger disparity between bulls and bears, and it didn't really work. But when both of them tend to get bearish very quickly together, like we saw in February of 2000, um, both February of this year, 2018, and also February of 2016, where we saw a huge, you know, a number of all of a sudden a flip-flop and more bears and bulls, that tended to be a lot more important. And so uh, I think we're getting there. I think we've seen the sentiment polls contract. Uh, I, I haven't really seen... You know the arms index and trend data yet and i use that for short-term trading i want to see really a lot of capitulation of volume before i'll think the low is at hand and so that's just probably one of five things that i look at specifically to say okay the market should be ready to rally i mean so you have a three to one negative advanced decline you want to see volume at like a six to one or better to really think okay we're getting and when better, I mean six to one volume in declining stocks versus advancing stocks so that the trend is at least at a two or higher to think that we're approaching a low. So a real capitulation of volume to the downside. And so I tend to use that as another tool that I think is useful, along with really put to call ratios spiking. And we really haven't seen that thus far in uh, you know the market Last couple of weeks, we've seen a little bit of a sell-off, and yet the equity put to call is not really spiked to the level I would have thought. And so you just don't really – it's been more indifference and disgruntlement more than it has been fear. So for me, that's a good recipe to think that, well, sentiment's getting there, but we haven't really seen the fear that could really put in a decent market bottom yet. So uh, those are a few tools. I, I think that in general – all of a sudden now, you listen to the media too, that's incredibly important. You hear people talk about, you know, could this be the end of the bull market? And, you know, are we starting to turn down? And what, what do you look for to think that a bull market's done? When you start to hear things like that, it really indicates, and really only within 5% of our all-time highs, uh, sentiment has started to turn. And so we're getting a little bit more pessimistic. So as a trader, I'm looking personally at, at, at lows in the market in the next uh, you know, couple weeks, and I think that we can bounce. But however, um, you know, the longer term sentiment takes some time. Um, so, I mean, Robert Prechter has written a ton of stuff about socionomics and sentiment and this and that. And I think it's all very valuable. But those are just a few of the tools I use. You've also mentioned seasonality a little bit today. Talk to us about how you look at and use seasonality. Well, I would just say simply that with regards to stocks, um, you know, historically during midterm election years, that tends to be one of the worst years of any uh, four year cycle. And, you know, thus far, it's been pretty bullish with regards to stocks. Stocks did not correct and uh, turn down in uh, the, either the second or the third quarter. And. Um, now we've entered the fourth quarter where seasonality is supposed to be, you know, quite bullish. And, and really this nine month stretch is typically one of the best of the entire four year cycle. But yet, you know, we started on a bit of a dour note with, with markets experiencing a lot of volatility. Um, so that's for, for that reason, I would say the seasonality with regards to stocks has not worked all that well. Um, I think that, you know, when you look at commodities and, and 
there's certainly different patterns of seasonality that tend to be, you know, very, very good and are worth paying attention to. And so we don't necessarily need to discuss them all here. But, um, you know, things like Stock Traders Almanac, they have a pretty decent record going back over the last 50 years of, of different things that tend to act well during certain times. I mean, gold tends to act well in the month of October. Uh, you know, we're seeing a little bit of rally and it just so coincides with the stock market pullback a little bit. But it's, uh, you know, crude oil tends to do its best, obviously, uh, from the from then the springtime, from February into the spring. So, you know, I, I think it gives you a little bit of an edge when you're you're really trading with the not only trading with the trend, but doing it when the, the seasonality really lines up. Uh, so try to just mirror, you know, a few different methods that, that try to work. Great stuff, Mark. Uh, we've got some rapid fire questions now if you're ready for those. Sounds good. All right, everybody. Our rapid fire segment is sponsored by Trading Technologies. Access the global markets from virtually anywhere with TT. They are the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. And now you can trade cryptocurrency spot and derivative markets side by side. For more information, please visit Trading Technologies. Dot com. Mark, first question for you. What traders influenced your life the most and why? Well, I would have to say, um, is, can this be a fictional character or is this going to be a lifetime? So I like W.D. Gann. I mean, he was a living person. He wrote, he really, I think, blew a lot of people's minds away with how he approached the concept of time and technical analysis. And he made, you know, millions of dollars. And it was rumored that he lost that too, but he really uh, changed how technical analysis is done. So I would list Gann. What was one of the hardest things for you to overcome learning about markets? Um, I think we all face this and just really learning that you can have everything in the world that tells you you're right, but yet price doesn't uh, work out. And, uh, and so it's really the, the ability to admit that I'm wrong. And so everybody faces that to a certain extent. I think it's cyclical. You know, there are periods of time of the year when you're good, there are periods of time when you're bad. You have to just identify that. But bottom line is you have to learn to take losses. So knowing when you're wrong and getting out of getting out of the, a bad trade. How has your technical analysis evolved over the years? Uh, it's become more multidimensional. I think it started out initially with just looking at daily charts and watching for breakouts. And, and I've added a lot of different things with regards to relative analysis, seasonality, sentiment, uh, time frame analysis, and more looking at time and wave structure. So I've, I've just added a lot of different tools and really a, a little bit of each and combined them in a way that I think uh, really adds to the probability of success. What is one attribute that you believe every technician should have? Um, I can answer that a million ways. It's tough and a rapid fire on that. You know, I think that you have to have a passion. I think you have to have a passion for the craft. Um, you can learn a, a ton, you can read a ton of books, but it's really having the passion for technical analysis that really will get you to that next level. Favorite book you've read lately? Um, I'm going to have to go back and say, you know, The Wave Principle of Human Social Behavior in the New Science of Socionomics. <laughs> Big title. Uh, Robert Prechter, he wrote it about 20 years ago. Stands the test of time. Not only is it a brilliant, well-written book on Elliott Wave, but it also covers... Uh, sociology and socionomics and really, you know, it really gets into a lot of the myths as to why things don't work and why sentiment is beyond that. And so that is a just a fantastic book. I'd recommend that for anybody looking. Favorite movie about trading? Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm trying to think of the last one that I saw that was really, really good. Let's say uh, Trading Places. What's the best piece of advice that you've received about markets? Be humble. Don't uh, have too much con too, don't have too much conviction. And typically, when you have a lot of conviction, you'll end up being wrong. So understand your own sentiment and your emotions. Uh, keep track of your emotions, and um, you know it's best to have a glass half full uh, approach, but also a glass half empty, where basically you're always looking out for what can be wrong with the market, not really patting yourself on the back when things go right. So know, you're really knowing where the exits are at all times. If you could go back in time and give the younger you a piece of advice, what would it be? 
You know, I would do things a lot of the same way I've done them. I've been really happy with my progress, and I've worked hard. I felt like I built a decent business. I uh, I don't know that I would change a whole lot dramatically. I, you just have to work as hard as you can, seek out good people, be positive, and uh, you know, try to try to make money, try to learn as much as you can, and, and make money uh, hopefully for yourself and for others around you. Last question for today: favorite thing to do when you're not working. Uh, I like cycling and I like playing poker, so I, I list those two. So uh, that's that's really it. Mark, where can people find you on Twitter and give us a website to check out? So you can find me at Mark Newton CMT. Uh, my website is newtonadvisor.com. Great insight today, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me on Futures Radio Show. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. I'd love to join you again sometime soon. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you have any questions or comments for myself or my guests, please visit futuresradioshow.com and sign up to be a premium member for free. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes.